The first Kerouac I read was not on the road, but Big Sur. My alcoholic diabetic friend, Harry, had given it to me saying, read this, it's just how you think on LSD. Later found out he was drying out, Jack was, from alcohol. We just started taking acid trips. Surfers and artists had brought some up from Hermosa and Laguna, and we soon had a connection in Berkeley. I was just back from six months of San Diego and Oceanside Marine Corps. The Vietnam War was escalating. I planned to go back to college, but was more interested in finding out the secret of the universe, and things became very immediate. If I was having fun someplace looking at the waves and realizing the ocean was one animal, a living being with consciousness, and that water lived through us, and we were all God, and girls would listen to me, I would not show up for my finals at junior college, even if I had mostly A's, because I, now I could talk to God. I could beg God to let me be a hero, a worker for the new way, the real old way, the way of peace and love. I couldn't be bothered with nowhere, jobs, school, applying for positions I didn't want. I was sent here for a far greater purpose. Life took on magical importance. I was discovering a world that existed alongside or inside the one we saw, and it seemed more real, certainly more magnanimous and heroic. I had seen the ultimate problem. It wasn't kill or be killed. It was love in order to be loved. It was up to me and my friends who were turned on to turn on the world, and there might, or there might not be a world. Unless we spread the word, the music, and the sacred energy, 1984, the book might come true, or worse, the time of God and the God. Anyway, uh, Harry turned me on to my first Kerouac. Next, I read On the Road and thought, Wow, Dean and Sal and Carlo have fun and sex and read books, value intelligence, and travel the whole country. They meet people from all walks of life and drive and go farther than Oregon or Ensenada. They go, go, go like athletes in pursuit of a vision of a life where kicks keep coming and everything magical you imagined about life, about our place in the universe, which we considered prime when we were we, and the joy of running through the grass, the smells, overwhelming us, came true. It was a ride into the future with the cargo from the past, the cargo that wasn't a bummer. It was a way to enter the atomic age without giving up our old kicks and desires. I was definitely for it. I wanted to join the hip beat wild love generation. I went to the university and looked for art students who looked like they turned on, as we used to say in the day. I went to student coffeehouse poetry readings. I saw the photos of napalm kids and realized what they were and became anti-war. I listened to jazz with new ears. Then I read Desolation Angels and in the foreword by Seymour Krim, who I met years later doing a New York reading together, said to me, I'm an urban man, but I can still appreciate your work. Explaining who the characters were based on in real life, so I went to Berkeley and bought How, The Happy Birthday of Death, The Golden Sardine, and Mexico City Blues, and was on my way to being a beatnik writer, which I assured my roommate who was going on into computers was the way of the future, not computers. I can count, subtract fast enough on my own. Give me some numbers. But this kind of poetry will get real popular the more people turn on and realize this is the new scripture. Ginsburg says, poet is priest. The God in the church is the false God. I know because I have seen God. Sometimes it is just a voice, sometimes like light, a light that electrifies the entire body, a blinding clear glow of molecule. It's what's behind the sky. So Dean Moriarty and Cody Pomeray was a real guy, the legendary Neil Cassidy, the inspiration of a wild new generation, the outlaw, hypersex, practical, oaky, visionary, great talker, we called it rap in California 66, philosopher, long-running party, rousing, driving, champion, mystical daredevil, who was desired, despised, loved, avoided, embraced, and emulated. Now he's driving King Ken Kiji's bus. The stories of his sexual prowess, his stunt driving, his powers to totally confabulate authorities, to talk his way out of and into shit, was all over Northern California. He was better than the book. Like a pretty boy Floyd, anything one could imagine Neil Cassidy had done was attributed to him. He was as good a driver as Sterling Moss, better. He could pick up more chicks than a movie star. He could make not up non-ending rhymes that made sense at the drop of that. 
He could transform ordinary people into celebrities instantly. Drive with one hand, roll with the other, and have sex too. He could hypnotize people with his rap. He could turn businessmen and suburban housewives into instant bohemians. Five out of ten stories might have been true. He was a man living up to, trying to outdo his legend just so folks wouldn't be disappointed? Or was it now a Baroque madness, STP-like madness, want to lick? An endless trip, sustained and harnessed frenzy from an unknown place. Seeing him juggle his sledgehammer or popping out at you with his Groucho Marx eyeball tricks and made me wonder if it was really one of us or some kind of probably benevolent prankster alien moving like a movie and Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin fast frame. That's how he could move, as if a strobe light followed him. You could only see half of his action. Dressed in plaid shirt, Levi's, actually cowboy boots this night. Balding, fit as a fiddle in a hay diddle dill. Here was a guy who knew how to harness every few and sinew in his hard body to accomplish what his mad, needy, proud, space-age synapses demanded. One of our musician songwriter buddies, David Anderson, had seen Neil walking down the street. Hey, Neil, hop in. Neil's walking through the door. You know he wasn't that tall, but boy, he'd be blazing and tall on his feet. He sees we have a couple kilos of Mexican red all broken up on the kitchen table. He really sees it. Takes an, oh my, over a motor surprise posture. Hands out like, you shouldn't have. And says, a block party. He quickly reached into his left breast pocket and pulled out a near empty Marlboro package and dumped its contents on the top of the pile. Two stems, three seeds, and four flecks of shade. Says, just wanted to do my share. Wow, I thought, this is the real it. How cool is that? He's there. He showed us all his boots, lifting his leg up, talking out loud but swift and smooth, like he's known everybody all his life, something about buffalo hide, about the changes in the American way, and why does karma seem so unfair sometimes, but what can you do? Might as well enjoy it. I thought I could understand what he was saying. He was a hero of mine, but I knew if I wanted to be a poet that works to save the world and succeeds, I had to make my own legends. I couldn't deify him, but Neil was real good. He was a live hero who did not disappoint. He was like a prankster god or science fiction. One of his apprentices, my good friend and rival in years to come, Pat Brady, it already acclimated me to the green Studebaker from China routines and the P-38s and 92s and your 12709D Electronic Academy certified routines. Neil proceeded to roll joints, one in each hand, lights them, passes behind his back. He's faster than thought. He's talking about a different subject individually with everybody in the room. I think he's already hit on my future wife. He's had drug conversations that were all metaphor, automotive conversations. One about the horrors of a certain disease with my future lifelong friend, Big Z. One about Hegel. Another about you've seen Herbie. And me, I know my jaw's hanging. I want to ask, this is a movie, right? Movies? Oh, we're going to see a movie. Who has the popcorn? Well, I can't go. I'm going to read my poems at the Jonah's Whale Coffee House. I've written some patterned at the Gregory Corso. Corso, I know Corso. It was back in 57. Jack and I, he sees I'm zonked. I can't believe I'm seeing and hearing this. He sees I'm not seeing the whole picture. I'm glorifying the moment for the wrong reason. I'm overwhelmed and stunned by the man who doesn't need the dough or social standing or machine power or formal education to be the fastest and most energetic man alive. And he comes over and extends his hand. My name's Neil Cassidy. What's yours? Andy Clausen. McGlossky? No, Andy Clausen. Neil Cass Cassidy. Andy Clausen. Neil Cassidy. Andy Clausen. Andy Makuski? Kuzuski? Clausen. Neil Cassidy. Andy Clausen. Neil Cassidy. We just kept shaking hands, saying our names like the tape was stuck. It might have only been a minute, but it seemed like a long time. I didn't know how to end it. Neil Cassidy. Andy Clausen. Then Neil produced a paperback copy of On the Road from his back pocket and read lines from it, answering the TV, which first had Bonanza on, then hand switched to Star Trek, but the conversation was perfect. Perfect. It was funny and eerily profound. Everything he said I took personally. All his words were codes for, from some forbidden pleasure kingdom in another dimension, some hip perception that lets one understand the game. Some of it was direct message to me. Have a child and name him after me. He would ramble and rap and deconstruct a movie blow-up. 
and we'll come back and talk everybody to sleep and have serious discussions with the wall and have cornflakes all set out for everybody in the morning, everybody their own napkin and spoon, and the stories would grow. And I did a stupid thing. I called him Mr. Cassidy. He hated that. And then I realized I'd missed the point. He was a legend. So what? He was one of us. Just a guy willing to work or whatever it takes to have kicks in life, to dig it and experience it because it's there and we don't know how many chances we'll have. He really did love the common people because he knew that was what he was. Oh, he valued the pursuits of intellectuals, but he valued the feelings that made intelligence possible much more. And through the intelligence that comes from the gut, Neil could see all had intelligence, and we all want our kicks. And the music, the dance, the drama, the trip, the seeking, the fervor, the no hang up stream, the explore and adore, maybe matador, the bull and the ram. Here was the authentic, the ex excellently flawed, modern, not perfect, every man double flawed, luminary legend who did not disappoint. The depiction of this prototype intellectual outlaw hustler down and outer and up again hipster by the films, art, literature of the day became embodied in this jail kid who raised a family part way and spent time in San Quentin for being generous and drove the muralized prankster bus and anything else and rode freight with his dad when he was just a lad and lost his dad on a freight car journey when he was 11 years old which was one of the major themes of On the Road, the search for Neil's dad. Women's eyes sparkled when he confided in them. He was a legend. He was a goof. He could do pantomimes and imitations of all walks of life, even cartoon characters, for laughs or a lesson exposing our indoctrination into societal restraints, like taking a shower with his clothes on or confessing to hang-ups that the listener he sized up had. Brady, would, who was a great guitarist, he would drive those slick Martin guitar virtuosos crazy. Because by watching their hands, he could play anything they played. Said he learned to play by listening to Neil talk. When we heard Neil died, Brady and I drove to Palo Alto to find one of Brady and Neil's good friends, Larry, who would know if it was true. We decided it wasn't true, and the three of us drove around all the night looking for him. For years after, I'd see someone on the freeway or the light going the other way, and I'd shout, Neil! And chase after the car, sometimes miles, and it was just someone who looked like Neil. But the one in Denver, I never caught. And the one going down North Kedger Street, Chicago, I swear it was Neil.